This is Riff Radio, a presentation of Riff Magazine Online, and this is Ledger Not Dead Yet. jam-packed edition of Riff Radio this month. Not one guest, not two guests, but three amazing guests joining us this month. We're talking to three front women, each from different backgrounds, different genres. They forge their own path, their own way. What do they have in common? They all rock. We're calling this the Women Who Rock episode of Riff Radio. We'll talk to one front woman who is quickly becoming a modern rock icon. We'll talk to an alt-rock singer-songwriter who left home at a young age to make her name in the music biz. But first, we'll talk to an incredible rock drummer stepping out from behind the kit for her own solo career. a multi-talented vocalist and musician. You know her as the drummer of the platinum-selling rocker Skillet. Now she's forging her own path on her own solo project, the aptly named Ledger. She recently released a self-titled debut and is heading out on the road in support of it. Jen Ledger, thanks so much for taking the time. Oh my goodness, thank you for having me. That was quite the intro. (laughs) Made me nervous. (laughs) So, as I mentioned, the new EP is out now. Uh, it's a great collection of songs, and a lot of people are f- most familiar with um, your work with Skilled as a drummer and, and vocalist. Um, when did you decide you wanted to tackle a solo project like this? Yeah, it was probably about six years ago, actually, that I started to get that nudging. I was like, we were, we've been touring all over the world with Skillet. I've been a part of Skillet for 10 years, and for anyone that's wondering, I'm not leaving the band. I'm just <laughs> kind of doing this side project and, and wanted to get into writing and Basically, I was just seeing how music was breaking boundaries. We were traveling from Japan to Australia to Europe, and these people that don't even speak English are, are, are speaking to us and sharing these stories of, uh, of music changing their lives or that you know, they were feeling like they were, wanted to give up or one person's like, I wanted to kill myself, but I heard your song and it saved my life. And the impact of music and the way that it break, breaks boundaries was just really... Honestly, eye-opening, and I was just seeing the power and influence of music uh, and the platform that I had as the drummer for Skillet, and I thought, why not Why not explore this? I, I love music, and if I can also learn to, to write songs and share my own heart, share my own thoughts, I hope that it can be a powerful tool, too, in, a, in another way. Now, one of the things I love about the project is, in some ways, you kind of kept it in the Skillet family, so to speak. I mean, you had um, your bandmates yeah. chipping in in as far as you know production or songwriting or like yeah. vocally on Warrior. Did, did it give you kind of an extra confidence having the support of your bandmates uh, when you were d- uh, <laughs> diving into this? Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. I mean, 
you can imagine, like, if you're in a band and one of your band members says they want to do something else too, that it could go either way. It could go like, why? What the heck? We, what, you know, are you not happy here? You know, and instead, when I shared my heart with the Coopers and, like, I just see the power of music, I'd love to get into songwriting. And uh, they kind of just came full force behind me in support. They were like, we get it. That's how they trained me. Um, and and what was really awesome about the project is not only how John and Corey trained me, like even as a drummer, they really took me under their wing as a musician. I was 18 years old, really green to everything. And they just helped raise me up in that. But they've also done the same with my songwriting and stepping out as a solo artist too. And um, because they know me so well, um, Corey Cooper, she's the guitar player for Skillet and like my best friend. And she produced my EP because, and because she knows all my influences, she knows what I love, what I hate. She she knows all of that. <laughs> and so having her at my side, helping me create this music was just extra thrilling because I'm not fighting with her on how I want the production to go. She knows me. She knows what I'm going to like and not like. And, and it ended up being um, an incredibly unique sound that, I felt like really represented me well, you know, it took some of my lighter and poppier influences, but mixed it with the fact that, you know, I've been a rock drummer for this touring rock band for 10 years now, and it's going to have that rock edge, but, but it has a lot of like just all round areas of me, the edgy side of me, the, the, the side that grew up listening to the Beatles and, <laughs> and the Jimmy world, as well as the, the girl that's been touring with Korn and, you know, I, I was just super impressed with the way that it all turned out. And it, it felt a little bit like a dream team to have the full support of my band where I'm able now to open up the night with Ledger and then close out the night with Skillet. I mean, who gets to do that? It's like all <laughs> of the best things at once. <laughs> um, I was going to say, for, for your first tour, you were pulling double duty. I mean, you were, you were opening a show with Ledger and then, like you said, finishing with Skillet. Do you have to prepare differently for those shows? I mean, at the end of the night, are you, are you just drained? You can imagine, right? I mean, yeah, it was like, I think I thought, I've been touring for 10 years, which is going to be like scary, but it's going to be, I'll be okay kind of a thing. Man, that first night stepping out for Ledger and being the person at the front, my knees were knocking. (laughs) And like, all of a sudden, I'm like, what do I do with my arms and legs? You know, I I was terrified. I wasn't expecting it to feel... So vulnerable. Um, I hadn't really wrapped my head around the fact that, like, you know, I think because I've come out with Skillet, I've sung Hero out front and a few different songs, I think I just assumed it would feel like that. But but not having the security blanket of going back to the drums and having John Cooper carry the whole show, I mean, he's, like, the most incredible front man, if you guys have ever seen him play. So entertaining. He's so funny. Um so not having that person to like banter between the songs and, and make it not awkward, you know, I was like, oh, this is on me. Uh, if this is awkward, it's because of you, Jen, you know. <laughs> so, well, it was a bit of a shift of what, what hat I was wearing. So after a few shows, I started to really find my footing. Um, I do prepare differently. Like the, the Ledger show, I just try to not look uncomfortable with my limbs and like <laughs> look like I belong. And by the end, I was really loving it. And whereas uh, with the skillet, basically I can just have it. It's, it's, I'm in the background. I feel free to do whatever I want and mm-hmm. have a great time. Whereas the ledger one, there's a bit more pressure on me to make sure that, you know, the fans have a, an excellent time and, and you engage them, you know, get them to their feet, get them involved, tell them about the song. So it, it was stretching, but awesome and exciting all at the same time. Right. Now, the first single, Not Dead Yet, was, uh, I believe it was born kind of out of a conversation you had with um, skillet guitarist Corey Cooper about some kind of anxiety issues you are having at the time. How did that song come about for you? Absolutely. Yeah, there was a, a season a few years ago where I basically started struggling with panic attacks. It was, I've never been through anything like that. I've had like the usual, oh, this makes me nervous type feelings, but... But this was like a whole new season and it was dark and it, it, it sucked. It was something I had to wrestle through. And after I got through that season, I thought, all right, surely you beat that now. Like once you've been through something that intense and come out the other side, you think, oh, great, I won. I'm done, you know. 
And it was about like a, a, a year later, I was on stage with Skillet and I felt like those old feelings of panic start coming back into my heart. And I came off stage and I felt so defeated. I basically went to Corey and I just said, I can't believe that I felt that way. After all these years of playing and wrestling through that season, uh, I can't believe I had that feeling again. And what if this is something that never goes away for me? And she just looked at me and she said, then you fight, Jen. Well, there's breath in your lungs. And until the day that you die, you fight and you do not let fear rob you of your own life. And so that was kind of the the conversation that this whole song was. It came out of. It was that resolve in your heart that it's okay if you struggle and it's okay if you have imperfections and things in your life that, that pop up and you have to fight through. The one thing that you can't let happen though is you can't let them take you out and stop you from ever trying. And for me, that's kind of like what fear or panic attacks made me want to do. It made me think, you can't do this. You can't write your own music. What are you thinking? If you, it made, it made me feel defeated before I even ever began. And the song Not Dead Yet is basically about, it's okay. You know what, maybe I'm not perfect and maybe this is something I'll have to fight again in my life. But I'm not going to let it hold me back. And I'm not going to let it stop me from taking these opportunities that are in front of me now. Right. Now, a lot of this album was written and recorded while you were on the road with Skillet. Uh, I was reading that you had to get a little creative sometimes with uh, with some of the recording yeah. process, uh, kind of based on where you were at at the time. So what was that like for you, <laughs> recording that? <laughs> uh, it's, honestly, it's pretty funny. Like, I'm used to being with Skillet, which is like this platinum selling rock band, and we do like the biggest studios with the amazing producers and, and whereas Ledger we did like in the back lounge of a bus in disgusting <laughs> grungy dressing rooms um, like sometimes we're trying to record stuff and we have to wait because line checks start so we're like <laughs> every time the guitar stops playing we quickly record a line and, and there's some pretty funny footage of me because there was one night we needed to get the uh, vocals in for the song Ruins, and uh, we were in a hotel. It's 10.30 at night or so, so I know I can't sing without waking up the guests at the hotel, and they're going to complain about it. <laughs> so basically, I just make shift my own vocal booth out of a chair. I, like, surround my head in pillows on this disgusting couch in a hotel. So who knows who's sitting, who's been sitting on that? And I'm like, well, got to do what you got to do. So it was basically... <laughs> Legend is like the unglam version of what do you think that a rock band looks like when they're recording their album. I'm like, you know what, though? It was freaking fun, and it was really, really exciting because, you know, it felt more freeing. Like, we're not spending a ton of money in this studio right now, where if I don't get my drums right in the first few takes, you know, time is money. Whereas this, it was like... Hey, try this. Oh, now let's try this. What do you think about it? it was it was actually really freeing because we got to do stuff without all the pressure on us. Uh, but man, it was pretty funny and, and really unglam. <laughs> <laughs> so now that you have some of the touring under your belt, uh, where do you want to go next from here? Do you want to get back on the road more? Do you want to get back in the studio and record more material? So what what is the future for this project hold for you? Honestly, everything, all of the above. That sounds awesome. I, <laughs> I feel like I started to really find my feet at the end of that tour and like was really loving and playing. Um, so I really, I'm super excited to get back out on the road. On the other hand, though, I have a ton more songs that, you know, we released this EP with just six songs, kind of see how it goes. And I've got all these other songs that we had a hard time kicking in between, to put, like which six do we put on here, you know? And so the idea of actually finishing them up and getting them out for the fans to hear, I'm like... I'm pretty excited about that too. So I kind of just have to like do everything at once. I think we're definitely starting to try and get those songs done, try and get this full length EP, uh, sorry, the full length LP out hopefully within the next, you know, eight months. Uh, And on top of that, we're also looking at different touring options and I'm hoping that I can do more where I'm opening up the night for Skillet so that I can do both bands because, Let's face it, that's really fun, and I wouldn't mind doing more of that. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, the Ledger EP is available out now. I'll get it on any of the uh, the streaming or iTunes, uh, anywhere music's available. And look out for the band, hopefully coming to a city uh, to a city near you soon. J- Jen Ledger, thanks so much for taking the time. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it.
Our thanks to Jen Ledger for joining us on Riff Radio. Next up, they just released their latest album, Vicious. This song is called Uncomfortable. It's Hailstorm. a true modern rock icon has one of the most powerful and distinct voices in music and has fronted the band hailstorm for the past 20 years the band is getting set to release its fourth album vicious next month and they'll be back in the bay area august 23rd to play the warfield in san francisco it's the amazing lizzie hale lizzie thanks for taking the time oh anytime that uh, and and first and foremost thank you so much for the compliments (laughs) (laughs) definitely (laughs) So let, let's start with the new album. I had a chance to hear Vicious actually earlier this week, and it lives up to its title. Uh, one of the f- uh, first thoughts I had listening to it was just how confident the band sounds in the, the songwriting and in the, in the performance. Um, but as I was doing some of the reading about the album, it sounds like that wasn't necessarily the case to start when you went in to start writing a new album. Uh, what, you know, what were some of the challenges you faced getting started on the new album? Um, some of the challenges that we ended up facing was was before we we got into the studio with Nick, um, we were writing songs. I, I I do that every day anyway. I've discovered that uh, my passion is sometimes my affliction because um, I can't really turn it off. I'm an avid uh, eavesdropper, and and I I write I write songs every day. Anyway, um, we were writing a lot for this record, and I think we we ended up writing about I don't know like fifteen twenty songs. And we just weren't 
feeling any of them. It, it felt like, I think early on, it just felt like we were trying too hard um, to to make everybody happy, um, to either please radio or do you think the fans are going to like this or, you know, just kind of, we're putting ourselves under, I think, unnecessary pressure and or just focusing on the wrong thing. So um, anyway, you know, at that point in time, after like, you know, you spend a lot of time on these songs and then we ended up scrapping them. We ended up throwing them all away. And um, and I kind of went down a small rabbit hole in my mind where it's like, man, you know, we've been in band for 20 years. Um, we're on our trying to make our fourth record on, on a major label. We've had so much success we you know we won a grammy we toured the world and i don't know whether like i i wasn't feeling connected the way i usually am to music i feel like i feel like it was just like i'd lost something along the way and it was um it was hard for me to shut that off and so you start going down this like spiral of of okay you know can i even like write a new song that that i'm excited about you know have i lost that um you know do I even deserve to be here? This is, you know, can I maintain it? You know, like, are, wow. are we like, what's going on? Um, so I had this kind of small panic moment <laughs> in my head. And uh, we, so we ended up going into the studio with, with uh, pretty much nothing. Um, we went in the studio and I ended up telling Nick, I'm like, I'm a little lost. Um, we all kind of are everything that we're kind of coming up with. We're not inspired by. And, um, and he said, uh, he, he's like, well, actually, you know, when was the last time that the four of you guys just got together and jammed for fun and um, and started the writing process that way? So what I, what we ended up doing is that we ended up kind of getting into his studio. It was just the four of us in the recording studio and Nick, our producer. And we started every day. He's like, all right, who's got a riff? You know, um, and he's like, this is what I did with what with Corn and... Uh, Queen of the Stone Age and Mastodon because it, he kind of gave, gave us this reassurance like, look, you know, you've had some success and sometimes when bands, you know, after like three or four records, you know, sometimes they don't know what to do and where to go next and so like this is where I usually start with just, just the nucleus of the band and so we ended up going in there every day and it was that same thing. He would be like every day, okay, who's got a risk? Who's got an idea? We'll just start there and then we would jam on that and start creating and, and going down this rabbit hole of a journey and uh and then nick would pop in and he'd be like oh that was cool that's awesome okay um that that isn't really working for me but maybe open it up here kind of he just kind of became this almost this coach you know or and and also this kind of fifth member of the band where he was kind of in the room with us just kind of being that uh that other voice so it really i mean through this process um what and i guess I, I'm so glad that, that you hear um, what we were kind of intending. But uh, through this process, we kind of rediscovered ourselves and rediscovered who we are as as a four-piece and as friends, um, as the absolute ground zero of Hailstorm. There's these four sides to the pyramid, and if you take one of those things away, it's just not the same thing. So um, so we, we ended up focusing on everybody's strengths and ended up, building this record from the ground up and and so what you see as the finished project it, product is us literally doubling down on everything that makes us who we are so yeah yeah i was gonna say i mean lyrically you're really kind of you know you're celebrating kind of empowerment and individuality and it has real you know, that that hailstorm swagger to it also was that i mean lyrically for you kind of the the rallying cry it became the kind of the the theme you wanted for the album yeah, you know, it's, it's it's interesting when when you talk about themes, because for me, it wasn't until the 11th hour um, of like after we already kind of had the record written. And and uh, one of the last songs that we wrote for the record was, was the title track, Vicious. And um, up until that point, um, we had a couple other titles for the record. And when we ended up kind of stumbling upon the word vicious, I'm like, oh, we have to write a song. You know, this is a great word. And and, and then I ended up calling, I ended up texting the guys at like four in, in the morning. I'm like, I think we need to call the album Vicious. <laughs> <laughs> so, I um, mean, it really wasn't until the end that you kind of saw everything come together. But 
throughout this journey, um, when we were writing, one of the most amazing things about writing a song and then being able to record it immediately was that the, the ideas were very fresh. They're very, you know, um, very right there on the surface. And so I, I was, we were writing as we were going along. And so all of these subjects were kind of me, yeah, going through that journey of this, this rediscovery and, and, um, and just self, uh, I guess, just battling that kind of self-doubt with songs. Which is kind of how I always I always do it anyway. Music has always been an extension of how I work through life and my problems and and all of that. To the point that I remember my parents saying that as a kid, and they would come in there because they would be listening to me writing these songs. They're like, "Are you okay?" <laughs> like, "Yeah, no, I'm actually really good now <laughs> because I wrote it." So, um, so what you're hearing on the record is is very much all of those ideas were just kind of being recorded as they happened. So um, it's just great to kind of come out on the other side swinging and being like, okay, we got this. <laughs> nice. Now, Hailstorm as a band have just been absolute road warriors. I think I saw you've played some like 2,500 shows. And I, I honestly actually don't remember a time when you guys haven't either been on the road or had a, you know, a tour coming up. <laughs> um, is it just a passion for being on stage and playing live that kind of fuels you to get back out on the road like that? Oh, absolutely. Um, we're we're not we're ninety percent live bands, you know, and and that's the way we've always done things. Because especially when we all first met and we were and we were kids, that was our outlet. That was that was because um, we we couldn't always afford to go and record or do any. And even even in the, especially in those early days, we had no real concept of how to even make like really good demos. So we would work all of our songs out live, and we would do that you know so touring was definitely one of those things um i think that was what made me catch the bug and and really the reason that we started hailstorm was because we loved playing out live so much it it um for me for me personally um it's become this is going to sound really cliche and cheesy but it's become this drug for me whereas uh, you know we'll have you know if we if we do get significant time off like let's say like more than a week um, after that first week, it's a little confusing because I'm like, man, there's just, I'm kind of bummed, like for no real reason at all. And, uh, and then like one of the, these, I live in Nashville now and we have a bunch of friends that kind of bring me up every now and then to just guest and I'll go and do like a gig with somebody. And then I'll be like, wow, I just feel so much better because <laughs> you know? I got that whatever that is, you know, that we're all kind of addicted to. So, um, so yeah, I, I think it's a primal need now to tour. That's great. Now this summer, you're going to be hitting the road, a big tour, got three great hard rock bands you're playing with all with female leads. You had Hailstorm in this moment, New Year's Day. I know this is a tour you've been really excited about. How did, how did this all come together? Well, honestly, this tour came together, um, months and months and months ago. We, we should be talking about it because, um, Maria and 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 Ash Costello, and then uh, we we took out uh, Misty from Step St- Heart on it as well on this last run. Um, we basically put this tour together because we've been talking about it for years, um, and but all of us are so busy that we never get a chance to tour together. And every time that like we have an opening day or you know how it goes, so we always just kind of see each other at the festival, and it became this running joke like. One of these days, we're gonna all be on tour together and actually be able to hang out and like be friends, and um, and so that's when we put the tour together was just out of kind of selfishly we wanted to hang out, but then what we didn't realize is that especially in this kind of in the state of you know the world today, uh, what we didn't realize was just how important it was for us to do this tour, not just for us on stage and kind of representing um, females, uh, you know, in 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 rock music. This is what we discovered on this first leg of doing this tour, um, was this, I, I guess, flip of the coin, I, I should say, whereas usually in the audience it's about 60-40 male-female, so mm-hmm. mostly male, then some female, you know, in the crowd because of who we are. And um, this tour, it flipped completely around, where the majority of the people in the audience are these women, and, and women that are like us, that love hard rock and metal, and, and that truly get off in this heavy music and making these heavy moments. And so what we've proven on this tour, not just, you know, in a general sense, but to ourselves, is that 
this genre of music is purely genderless, and I know it's typically related to this to masculinity and and this it's a man's world type of genre, but it truly isn't. Um, and that's what we're seeing on the side. It's just amazing on the other side of it for myself and 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 Marie and I were actually just talking about this the other day. Um, how amazing it is to now all of a sudden be these people um, that get to stand on stage and look at all of these young women and basically tell them that we are living proof that they can do whatever they want to do. You know what I mean? No one can ever tell you that you can't do something because we're standing up here. You know, and and so it was just it was just been such an amazing um, uh, tour just for that, and it's a very humbling thing to be part of. Now, kind of an extension of that. I mean, you, you mentioned you know there's a lot of women and girls that look up to you specifically, kind of as a, a trailblazer, as you know, fronting as a female fronting a hard rock band. Were there as as you were coming up, you know, starting out as a band, were there kind of roadblocks along the way? Do you think the you know the path is a little clearer now than it used to be? Kind of, what what's been your uh, your experience with that? There's been a couple of different levels of, of discovering um, what it really is, you know, to be a to try to carve out your own path as, as a girl. And in the beginning, I think my uh, my my naivete um, actually played in my favor because I kind of had blinders on to all of it. Like, and, and I grew up in a household that was never even really mentioned that. Oh yeah, no, in the real world, there there are some limitations. What people think that you can do because you're a girl. Um, because I grew up in, in this amazing household where it's like, really, I mean, my parents always told me, like, if you want to be a mechanic, if you want to be a rodeo player, it doesn't matter, we'll support you, whatever you want to do. Um, there was no feeling. So when we first, you know, started out um, playing and, like, and touring, um, I would, there would be these small moments, like, you know, that I would just kind of, like, turn a blind eye to. Or, or just be like, oh, you know, that's ridiculous. And so the, there are these moments, like specifically, um, you know, in the you know where people would be judging you on the fact that you're a girl. So, so there, you know, I was always, you know, you know, directed toward wherever the merch booth was because they were assuming that I was the merch girl. Or um, so, who are you dating in the band? Uh, so I was assumed that I was the girlfriend at some point. Um, there was a specific moment I remember in '05 when we really started kind of professionally touring um, on when we just first got signed. And um, at the time, we didn't have any uh, text or anything doing any of our, you know, guitars or anything. So I was stringing my guitar. I was restringing my guitar side stage. Yeah. And these two stagehand guys kind of came up, and they're like, oh, that's awesome. You know, you are so cool. My girlfriend never does that for me. And uh, <laughs> oh, at least assuming that I'm helping out my boyfriend in the band by restringing his guitar. Oh, wow. Wow. Um, and so I didn't even say anything. I didn't like, you know, I didn't even like stand up for it because it was kind of this weird thing in my mind. I'm like, why did he say that? That's so weird. Um, but anyway, so like later on in the night, I get up on stage and do my thing. And, and later on, those guys are like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. Like, I didn't realize you were in the band. And um, so that was like kind of that first kind of instance of, oh, okay. Um, I, there's, there's all these like preconceived notions that, that, of who I am, and it's a big reason why I ended up putting um, some of those things into uncomfortable because, uh, you know, it almost became my power after a second, whereas I, I used it as a weapon, um, whereas I knew that I'm usually going to be the only girl in the panel and no one's really going to assume that I'm even in the band. So, um, so I would purposely I would end up you know, dressing up in a skirt or wearing high heels or something like that that was not normally seen, you know, whilst holding a guitar. And uh, I even took it a step further uh, for a long time when we were proving ourselves on the road. Um, I would end up starting a cappella. So I would have the guys in the back and I would come out because it would be one of those moments where people, you see on people's faces, like, what the hell is going on? Who is this chick? <laughs> you know, um, so, so using it kind of, like I said, as a weapon. Um, and then you get to a point where you're talking to like labels and to radio people, and, and uh, this is before we were signed. Actually, um, a lot of these moments were we were trying to shop ourselves to labels or to management or anywhere. And I would get these people, these industry people, telling me like, "Look, I, I love what you guys do, but we don't know what to do with you." And I would always ask why, and they're like, "Well, you know." 
female fronted bands don't really work on rock radio. And, and even if you do get on radio, um, if they already have another female fronted band that play, they're not going to play you because you've already filled that spot. Throughout my life, um, you use those kind of roadblocks and those, you know, negative views that normally would um, would kind of bring you down because it was kind of a bummer every now and then. Be like, Jesus, this is so ridiculous. Why, you know, this, why, why is that idea out there? Why can't it just be about do you rock or do you not rock? You know, so like, <laughs> for me, that was what I grew up on. Like, I've heard a lot of amazing male from the band and female from the band. And I've heard a lot of shitty ones, too. It's like it should just be about talent. Um, so anyway, now it's amazing to kind of be on that other side of it. Whereas nobody, uh, you know, usually when we play a show, like people know who I am or they know that I'm in the band, that kind of thing. And, and, um, and I've seen, just if you go to any rock festival, um, there's a good 40 to completely split 50-50 um, percent of female front of bands to male front of bands. And so it's amazing to be surrounded by so many women. I'm no longer the only one on, on tour, usually. Um, and that's not just musicians, but there's female lighting directors. And, and um, especially on this tour, there's like 13 girls. There's between Marie and all of her dancers, and then there's two um, female tour managers, and there's female lighting directors. And, um, it's just amazing to see these girls truly just kind of, you know, infiltrate <laughs> the industry. And it's amazing to kind of be in a position where I'm able to um, be that kind of beacon of hope for a young girl. Because when I was growing up, I had to reach back, you know, to my parents' generation to be like, oh, see, that girl's family, you know, that's pet guitar, that's heart, you know, and they did it, so that means that I can do it. So just to be with someone right now is is probably the most rewarding thing and and a big reason why I, I look back and I'm and I say, you know, of all of the things and obstacles and ups and downs, tremendous ups and tremendous downs that we had to go through, um, it was completely worth it in order to be that for somebody. So yeah, it's 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 pretty fantastic. Excellent. Well, the the new album is vicious. The first single, uncomfortable. The uh, new song, Black Vultures, just dropped today. Catch them August twenty third at the Warfield. Yeah. Uh, Lizzie Hale of Hailstorm, thanks for taking the time. Oh, dude, anytime. Thanks for listening to me ramble. That is no small feat. So (laughs) you're a brave man. Awesome. Thank you so much. My thanks to the incredible Lizzie Hale from Hailstorm. Next up, she also just released a brand new album, Take Me to the Disco. It's Meg Myers. This is the first single, No. This is Riff Radio. Broken road. 
Joining me now is a great singer-songwriter, incredible live performer from Los Angeles by way of Nashville, Tennessee. Her second full-length album, Take Me to the Disco, and getting back out on the road touring America, she is Meg Myers. Meg, thanks for taking the time. Hi, thanks for having me. So let's start off with the new album, it's, uh, Take Me to the Disco. It's been a long time coming for you. I think I saw that you wrote over 50 songs for it and recorded 30 more. Uh, but what's it feel like yeah. to finally have this see the light of day and uh, have it being released? Oh, it feels so good. It's such a, um, it's such a relief, and and also I'm just really excited to, after such a crazy year, finally get get it heard and get the new <clears throat> the new sound <clears throat> out there and uh, and get it connected to my fans and and everyone. I'm really excited. Yeah. Nice. Now I I got a chance to hear the new album and it's it really showcases kind of a progression of you know songwriting and um you know in just the way the songs are created and some of the lyrics and uh, it has kind of a dark intensity mixed you know we had big percussion in there almost an orchestral feel on some songs. What, what was the yeah. direction you wanted to go in on this album? Um, you know, I didn't really know I, before I did it. I think I was. Uh, I had taken a couple of years and I was writing, but I was kind of unsure of where I wanted to go with music after the last, uh, after that first record, I got a bit, a bit burnt out pretty quickly. <laughs> um, and I just, of course, I want to keep making art, but I wasn't sure. So I was writing all this stuff and it was all a little all over the place. Um, so it wasn't really until I met my producer, his name is, uh, Leggy Langdon and we did this album together, uh, he wrote it with me and, and produced the whole thing. And it wasn't really until I met him that we honed in on what we were, we, we were kind of sharing music back and forth of the stuff that we both love from like stuff from our childhoods to teenage years right. to right. now. And, and we just got really inspired and just, just, uh, yeah, I don't know. We just kind of found it. We just discovered it together, you know? Nice. <laughs> it was really cool. And and we both have a love for classical music, and that was something that we really wanted to incorporate was um, some live strings on the album, and that was exciting for me since I, nice. that was the first time I got to do that. Now, the first single, Numb, was kind of a more of a straight-ahead rock song, uh, actually started kind of as a kiss-off to your prior record label. Kind of what was the story about how that song came about? Yeah, so that was um that was written at a I was in a frustrated state um and just feeling a lot of pressure from my label at the time and I felt like I you know they wanted me to write a radio single that was kind of what that's you know when you're in a major label especially that's what they're going for is the radio single and we couldn't um seem to turn in what they were looking for. And so we just wrote that song and we were like, cool. Well, here it is. <laughs> and it's about you guys, <laughs> you know, but, um, but you know, it's all good. It's, a, it's, I'm very grateful for them for the opportunity, you know, and obviously the opportunity to have made the album. So right. Now, when you're dealing with the frustration from a label like that, I mean, does it fire you up and make you want to write a hundred more songs, or does it, like you said before, does it sort of burn you out from the whole thing and just kind of turn you off for a bit? I think it turns you off for a little. Yeah, I think he was getting a little bit. Um, we, I mean, we just started writing, like me and Lucky just started writing like the most crazy stuff we felt like, <laughs> like going way out there because we were just like, all right, like. We're obviously not going to please them, so let's just like not even think about it. Let's just write, and that's kind of what happened with Numb too. We were just like, "All right, we're not even going to try," and then it, you know, <laughs> like <laughs> there you go. Now, uh, the great thing about a song like Numb, I mean, it, it's born out of your own personal experience, but there's kind of a universal quality to it. I mean, a lot of people can relate mm -hmm. to it, whether it's being. You know, trapped in a job and a relationship or just kind of yeah. dealing with life. And you sort of show that in the video a little bit. What, what was that one like to shoot? Yeah. I mean, that, that's the cool thing about the song and on, and also a lot of other songs on the record for me is I, I think that a lot of them had this meeting when we wrote them and took on a, an, another meeting, um, just expanded meanings 
later on going back and listening. Right. Um, and that happened with Numb also because we wrote it and there was this feeling about the label, but it was like, you know, there's just a lot of feelings going in when you're writing something mm-hmm. and it's kind of like stream of consciousness in a way too. You know, you're just singing things and saying things and just, yeah. Um, so we looking, when we went to look for a director, we found uh, Clara, Clara Aronovich and she came up with this concept and um me and her really clicked on it uh, it felt like that was something that like the, what it's saying in the video i felt like that was something that um it was sort of turning into the meaning that it was sort of turning into anyway right, is right. not just the pressure in the label but the pressures of life and and being a woman you know being a human on this planet and in certain, these certain situations and and how it makes you feel and that was really cool that we were able to collaborate in that way. Nice. And now one of the things you mentioned earlier, uh, you worked in some, you know, working with live, live strings on this album. Uh, I, I assume yeah. that was the first time you'd done that for a, for a studio album. Kind of what, what was that process like, you kind know, of working them into the songs? Well, my producer really did a lot of it. He worked with um, a, a quartet on that mm-hmm. and, I kind of let him take over that, you know, I was in the studio the Mm -hmm. whole time, but it was like, it was for me, it was more just watching and, you know, giving very small input, (laughs) but I trusted him a lot with it. And he actually has been in uh, a few bands for many, many years. And he used to, I mean, he had like orchestras and shit on (laughs) on some of his albums. Like he's just a bit of a genius. So, uh, it was really incredible to watch that though. And like, just that's one of my favorites, just live strings, you know, ever. And right. so it's just to be able to sit in there and have that was, it was, uh, it was amazing. It was really, <laughs> really amazing. I can imagine. Now you just had just starting to head back out on the road. You did a few dates, uh, before the album release here, uh, then coming up with the full tour, uh, in fall, uh, mm-hmm. what's, uh, what's it been like getting out back onto the road again? Does that sort of make everything real for you that's actually happening? Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, I've always had a love hate relationship with the road. Um, the, the shows are like, I, I just, it's like everything to me and connecting with fans and, just being able to express myself in that way, um, it it feels it's like just unreal. Mm-hmm. And then you come out of it, and then you're doing all the other stuff around it, and you're traveling, and you're you know, and it's. I think I, I'm still trying to figure out how to do it and stay, you know, a hundred percent. I got a bit sick on this on this last run, but. At the same time, then it's like the next day and you go on stage and you're just like, yes, this is why I do it. And then you like get on a plane and you're like, everything sucks. And then you're on stage and you're like, and you're like, oh my God, everything's amazing. Yeah. So, yeah. I was going to say, I mean, um, your, your live show is such a reflection of you as an artist. I mean, it's you know, real kind of intense and focused and energetic and soft to heavy and back mm-hmm. and forth. And I mean, do you have to like totally. mentally yeah. prepare yourself for that every night or is it just come just like second nature to you now? Um, it comes, but this is what I'm trying to figure out. Okay. Is like, I, if I'm rested and I'm like healthy feeling, I can go out there, I can connect to the songs and the audience and myself and everything. And it just feels good. Mm -hmm. But if I'm not feeling very well, you know, if I get out of the routine, I get unhealthy or I'm too exhausted, I get out there. I still connect deeply to the songs, but it's like in a darker way. Mm-hmm. So, and I don't think it's as healthy for me because it's more like, um, what is that called? The acting when you're, um, uh, when you become the part, you know? Um, oh, yeah, God, yeah. I can't think I, of what, yeah, yeah. I know what you're talking about, so but I can't like, think of the word. <laughs> I can't think of it right now, but method acting. There you like, go. Basically, you know, it's like, not that I'm acting when I'm out there, but like I'm just connected and I'm feeling good. And then, and I'm, and I'm, that was like, I would say it kind of started out that way. And then like, you know, as time goes on, like I can, if I start getting down that spiral, then it can be like, I'm still connected, but it is like getting dark. (laughs) So I'm like, you know, yeah, it's very, it's very extreme. And you know, each show can be different too. It can be every other or something. One can be up, one can be down. It's just kind of 
I'm, I'm a really moody person too. <laughs> so I think just, you know, so, we're working through it. <laughs> yeah. So now for you, let's just sort of go back to the beginning for you. You left uh, home at 19 to pursue a career in music in L.A. Uh, parents were yeah. Jehovah's Witnesses. You know, what was the journey like for you just kind of starting? What, what was uh, the, what was that experience like? Um, starting in L.A.? So just kind of get, getting getting your career off the ground kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Well, it took me a while. I, I was just working in coffee shops and restaurants and um, I waitressed for a good 10 years, 12 years or something. And I, um, I think I just, you know, I had an acoustic guitar and I was mm-hmm. like, I didn't even understand what it meant to make an album really with it and finding a producer and all that stuff. I was like, you find a band and then you make an album. And, <laughs> um, I didn't know. So I was just looking and trying to find musicians all the time and things were sometimes cool and then sometimes not working out and Mm -hmm. um it was just really going around playing shows acoustic for a long time until i found my uh first producer dr rosen rosen Mm -hmm. and he's the one that we i made uh my first two eps and first album with and that was when i really started you know uh just my my, my journey really started in this with with this you know meg myers project Mm -hmm. uh nice so yeah, it was it was crazy and I was not really, you know, I was always broke and like just trying to get by and sleeping on couches and I don't know, you know, sometimes had my own place or my own room somewhere, but it took me a while definitely to get I think it wasn't until I was like 24, or 25 when I met Dr. Rosen Rosen and yeah, and I'm 31 now, so it's been a long well, 11 years. <laughs> there you go. So uh, yeah. the new album is Take Me to the Disco. First single is Numb and uh, Jealous Sea just dropped today. Also a, just an amazing yeah. song. Uh, you're going to be live in, in the Bay Area October 16th at the brand new August Hall. You're going to love the venue. It's amazing. Uh, sure to be a great oh, night. God, I'm so excited to come up there. Oh, <laughs> my gosh. Very cool. Uh, tickets at TicketWeb.com. It's October 16th at August Hall in San Francisco. Meg Myers, thanks for taking the time. Yeah, thanks for having me. Everything's right, everything's wrong. But when you call my name, I can't help the thought of always being gone. But when I'm wearing this ring and I want to go out, I want to get drunk. 